In Isaiah 42, verse 16, it says, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. When I was uh, quite young, my brothers and I and my friends, we came up with a plan, a game that we decided to play. I think I may have shared that with you in the past. I, I think I have. We would uh, fill these hockey wooden socks, you know, these long socks. And we would take other socks and bunch them up and put them in the bottom of the stocking. And then we would tie a knot. And then you'd have these this nice sling and what we would do is we would go in our basement at a, my parents' place and uh, we'd take pieces of cardboard and we'd seal all the windows really tightly and whatever so that there was no trace of light anywhere. And then one of us, well, we'd all go into our different corners in the basement and one of us would <clears throat> flick the light and it was pitch black. It was so dark and I remember because you could put your hand right in front of you and you couldn't see a thing. And then we would go on the prowl. We'd start sneaking around, seeking, listening. You could hear just a footstep or something, somebody shuffling along and we would get closer and closer, try to get closer. Meanwhile, somebody's probably doing the same thing to you. <laughs> and, and once we sensed there was somebody near enough, we would just start swinging and banging each other and hitting each other with these, crazy weapons of ours, weapons of mass destruction. And uh, whoever managed to survive to the end without being hit, well, of course, that was the winner. It, we thought it was great fun. We just did this. We did it for hours on end. And of course, on the odd occasion, somebody would end up with uh, being hit in an eye or walk into the telepost in the center of the room and get a bloody nose or something. But we all thought it was all worth the price. Haven't you all played blind games sometime in your life? Maybe uh, pin the tail on a donkey or something to the, of that nature. I'm sure we've all been blinded, blindfolded once or twice in our lives. And we kind of like to play the game and see what's it like, you know, to be completely blind, can't see a single thing. I get the feeling it's a very different story, though, for somebody who does not have the option of removing the blindfold when they're tired of playing the game. I couldn't imagine living day by day in total darkness. I have no idea of the frustration it must bring for a person who doesn't have a choice. You might be tempted to think that a blind person gets used to that their condition, and I'm sure that to some extent they do, but um, I suspect they'd give anything to be able to regain their sight, their ability to see. How would you feel if you would never look into the eyes of a loved one or watch a sunset or look at the beautiful flowers growing in the springtime. You know, one day, Jesus was walking through the town, Jerusalem, I'm imagining, and um, he came upon a man that had been born blind, had never seen his entire life. And since his disciples were with him, they too saw the blind man, and they were prompted to ask Jesus his opinion as to why this man had to be suffering such a tragic, such tragic circumstances. I invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter two, chapter nine, or rather, John chapter nine, and we'll pick up the story from there. The Gospel of John, chapter nine. In verse 1, it tells us that Jesus saw a man who was blind from birth. And in verse 2, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? An interesting question. Who sinned? Was it this man? Or was it his parents 
that he should be born blind. The disciples, like most people back then, assumed guilt was always directly accountable for every bad thing that happened to a person. Every misfortune, whether a physical aberration, financial ruin, or family tragedy, was directly associated with some sinful indulgence. What did you do that you should suffer with this? Now, I have no doubt that every bad thing comes as a result of sin, but this truth was carried to an excessive point, that by Satan's device, they went so far as to believe that every disease and death came about by an arbitrary punishment from God because of a bad and willful or willful choice. And what made things worse was that the person who was so struck by whatever affliction was also labeled a terrible sinner. What a disgusting person. What did you do that God should do this to you? To some extent, that's what happened to Jesus as well. We're told in Desire of Ages, page 471, he who hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows was looked upon by the Jews as stricken of God and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. You know, it's really quite interesting that they should have had this attitude because they had been given a lesson in their own scriptures on this very subject in order to prevent this kind of thinking. Job's experience makes it very clear that suffering and calamities are inflicted by Satan, not God. And very often, God will even go so far as to intercept the bad for his purposes of mercy. But somehow, Israel never did learn the lesson. The same mistake Job's friends made was repeated by the Jews many years later. And so Jesus continues, and he says to his disciples, he says, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. For whatever reason, Jesus chose not to explain the cause of this man's blindness, maybe, maybe because it was totally irrelevant. We love to blame somebody for the bad that happens in their lives. We have this inherent need to scapegoat all of our problems. It must be this person's problem, it must be that. It's because of something they did and that's why they're suffering the way they are. J Jesus' disciples were no different. But he simply ignored their need to blame and instead, he focused his attention, their attention, on what would be the results. He says that the works of God may be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. And while it is day, I am the light of the world. I think you'll notice that throughout this story, there's a play on words that goes between night and day, blindness and sight, darkness and light. By practical means, Jesus intends to do a couple of things. Now, I wish I could use a better expression, but I couldn't find one, and so I'm going to use this one. Please forgive me, but Jesus is intending on killing two birds with one stone. He continues in verse 6, when he had spoken, thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Sil Siloam, which by interpretation means sent, and so the man went his way therefore, therefore and washed and came back seeing. Christ's first purpose is to bring a man who's been living in complete darkness all his life into the world of light. He wants to set him free. He wants him to experience the power of God's love in his life. And he does this amazing thing for him. Can you imagine never having seen your, your entire life and then your eyes are opened? Who did this man think of God now? Wow. And also by this wonderful healing, Jesus wanted to show his disciples clearly that the work of God is to, dis to restore, not to destroy. 
Disease and death don't come from God. They are not punishments arbitrarily inflicted on account of sin. Whatever afflicts you, whether it be a, of a physical nature or emotional or social or spiritual, the God revealed in Jesus is a God intent on healing and saving, not punishing, not getting even. The scripture says, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light and before them in crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. I praise God for those verses in the Bible where it says, I shall not fail you nor forsake you. I have so often claimed those promises for myself. In times when I felt despair when I felt depressed when I felt discouraged with my own failings and I would come to God and remember I may fail but he doesn't he never fails he doesn't even know what the word means if you'll excuse my what I'm saying here the story goes on to tell us that when the neighbors saw the man who had been blind they had a hard time believing that it was the same person some even questioned whether it was him. His whole appearance was so completely changed. And, and he had to finally tell them that he was who they thought he was. And when they asked how he had received his sight, he told them of Jesus and how he had anointed his eyes with clay. And after washing in the pool, he was able to see. Now, I know that this is a very personal question and I don't mean to impose on your business, it's none of my business, but when Jesus took you out of the darkness of sin and brought you into his marvelous light, did people see something different in you? Can they tell that you have been changed? Did you take the opportunity to tell them about Jesus and how incredible he is. I don't know what prompted his neighbors to bring this man who had been once been blind to the Pharisees. I don't know what they were thinking or whatever, but anyway, they did. They brought him to the leaders of the church. And wouldn't you know it, the healing that he had experienced actually took place on the Sabbath. And that was a big problem. And so the leaders, of course, they said, this man can't be from God. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath. But others felt that he had to be from God. How, how else could he have performed such an amazing miracle? And so the story continues in verse 17. So the leaders said to the blind man again, what do you say about him, Jesus? Because he opened your eyes and he said, well, he's a prophet. And the Jews did not believe concerning him. But he had been blind and received his sight until they had called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Now you can just imagine the spot these parents found themselves in. It had been declared that if anyone would acknowledge Jesus, that he would be thrown out of the synagogue for 30 days. Can you imagine? Now, you and I may not be able to imagine. We might think, well, no big deal, so what? You know, 30 days, and then I'll go back to church, and so on. But to them, it meant something big. If some of them were having a little baby, they knew that they had to circumcise that ba baby in eight days, and uh, they weren't going to be able to do that. And if someone were to die, they were not going to be able to lament that person for 30 days. And if it failed to produce repentance on the part of these individuals, a far heavier penalty would, would follow. Verse 20 continues, it says, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know, or, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him, he'll speak for himself. Of course, he had already spoken for himself. And they didn't like what he had to say. They wanted, they wanted something to condemn Jesus with, not proof of his divinity, 
Nevertheless, the Bible says that they drilled him yet again. In verse 24, it says, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And I just love the way that, you know, the, the, the man who used to be blind responded to them. And he says, well, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind and today I see. You know, sometimes it's hard to argue with someone's experience. It's hard to tell them that what they're going through is not so. I think that's why a person's testimony is the most effective means of witnessing. You know, you may feel inadequate, inadequate when it comes to sharing verses from the Bible. You might not uh, be able to rhyme off promises from memory, but every one of us ought to be able to tell others what Jesus has done for us. Amen? Absolutely. And I don't care if you were born and raised in the church, because every one of us at some point came to a place where we gave our hearts to the Lord. We felt our need of Jesus, and he has changed our lives. Again, they want him to repeat his story. Again, they want him to go over every detail, and in verse 27, he answered them, I have told you already, and you didn't hear. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be his disciples? <laughs> I just love the way he, he does this. You know, it's just, I don't suppose he could have insulted them more. But then in verse 20, 28 and 29, it says that um, then they reviled him and they said, we are, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke through Moses, but as for this fella, we don't know where he is from. Now, inspiration tells us at this point that the Lord Jesus knew the ordeal which the man was passing, and he gave him grace and utterance. He spoke to his heart so that he became a witness for Christ. He answered the Pharisees by words that were a cutting rebuke to his questioners. They claimed to be the expositors of Scripture, the religious guides of the nation, and yet here was one performing miracles, and they were confessedly ignorant as to the source of his power and as to his character and claims. You remember what Jesus said once at one time back in Luke 12, verses 1 and 11, or 11 and 12, he said, And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Folks, I believe that that's precisely what happened to this man and watch as he blows them completely out of the water with logic and eloquence. If you go to verse 30, verse 30, the man answered and said to them, well, this is a marvelous thing, that you don't know where he's from, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that man does, uh, God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a uh, is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And since the world began, it has not been, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. It makes no sense. If he was able to do this, surely to goodness, if this man were not from God, he says in verse 33, he could do nothing. And so he met them on their own ground. They couldn't argue with his reasoning. And we're told that the Pharisees were astonished and they held their peace, spellbound by his pointed, determined words. For a few moments, there was nothing but silence. But once they regained their composure, they apparently wrapped their robes around themselves. They shook off the dust off their feet and... Uh, hurled denunciations against the man. You were all together born in sins and you dare teach us? And right then and there, they excommunicated the man. Folks, your testimony will always have one of two reactions. I, either people are going to love you or they're going to hate you. They will either be drawn to God's message of salvation or they'll resist the Holy Spirit and walk away. Either they will welcome the light or crawl back in the dark where they came from. 
And that's what happened to these men toward Jesus. The Bible says that in Jesus, in him, was life. And the life was the light of, the, uh, of men. The light shone in a dark place, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You know, some time ago, there was a major blackout in New York City. Unfortunately, it, was, it wasn't the cause of any serious harm, as far as I recall, at least not in the context of today's world. But you know, people will sometimes do strange things when they're caught in the dark, spending an entire night in a dimly lit subway and no way to get out, no electricity, no light, no not just a little bit of dim battery or whatever. And some of the folks, they, they felt like, you know, they felt the whole air was so eerie, it was scary. It was, it was a, sc a scary ordeal. And yet when you take the time to think about it, it's a perfect illustration of the world that we live in, a world dark in sin. There was a time when you and I were blinded by sin. Strangely enough, though, we were pretty comfortable in our blindness, maybe because, well, it's all we ever knew. But one day, Jesus came into our, our lives and our eyes were opened. Now he wants us to share that light with everyone who will receive it. What do you say we let Jesus use us to brighten the world around us? Remember the joy that you felt when you first gave your heart to him? Think of the happiness you could bring to a neighbor or friend simply by flashing a little light their way. In verse 35, it continues and says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he found him, he said to him, you believe on the Son of God? The blind man who had been blind, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, you have both seen him, and it is he that talks to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. My dear friends, there's a whole world out there that's waiting for somebody like you and me to ask them that very question. Do you believe on the Son of God? I will bring the blind, blind by a way they knew not. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. The Lord says he will never forsake anyone. May we all be of that same mind. Shall we pray? Our gracious and compassionate Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the demonstration, the illustrations, the stories of the Bible, those places where Jesus did amazing things for people who were doing, going through horrible experiences in their lives, and he was able to heal them. May he heal each one of us, Father. Heal us from sin. Heal us from the darkness of the world around us. That we may be like a light uh, on a hill that everyone may be able to see, that they may receive glory, that you may receive glory, that you may be praised always is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.